Okay, this is titled Glowing Pterodactyls. I'm sorry. Glowing Pterodactyl Mystery Lights at Night. And it should begin now. So we should be on right now. Okay, the title here is actually the full title is uh, Glowing Pterodactyl Mystery. Excuse me. Glowing Pterodactyl Mystery Lights at Night. We're going to be going into, first of all, the uh, sightings by uh, Evelyn Cheeseman, an entomologist from Britain, who uh, explored in the Southwest Pacific in the early 20th century into the middle 20th century, uh, searching for insects and other animals and creatures. And she had an incredible sighting. We'll also be getting into the Marfa Lights of Texas and, and Southern Texas and how that might relate to rope and lights of uh, Papua New Guinea and to the uh, strange flying lights that were observed by this scientist, uh, biologist, Evelyn Cheeseman, in the early 20th century. So we are going to start now with uh, Evelyn Cheeseman's sightings. I had um, an associate of mine who, who was in Derbyshire, England, uh, a number of years ago, going through an old bookstore, used bookstore, and he happened to cross uh, this old book, and he found something fascinating. He bought the book because he found something fascinating in this old book by Evelyn Cheeseman. And he knew about my research and about the possibility of uh, bioluminescent pterosaurs in the Southwest Pacific, and he was fascinated, and he contacted me and sent me images from the book. It was fascinating. I said, this is incredible because it relates to my expedition, our findings that my associates and I made in expeditions in Papua New Guinea, including my own expedition in 2004 on the island of Amboy. Fascinating stuff. I'll just go through a little bit of this. Miss Cheeseman, I'm sure we don't have already some, some people that are getting on here because sometimes they come on a little earlier. No, they don't. Okay. So... This British biologist who was searching for new creatures, new species, and eventually a number of species where different animals were, were named for, for her, Cheeseman, so on. But she was out at one night uh, on a veranda of this hut or house that she was at, uh, deep in the mainland of what's now Papua New Guinea, but the, the large island of New Guinea. And she saw in the distance some strange flying lights. And... Um, she was fascinated by these. She started studying, observing them. She was very careful at observing. She's a scientist. And she saw that they lasted... Let me get this correct. Evelyn Cheeseman said that they lasted four to five seconds. And one would appear and another would appear and they were flying horizontally on approximately the same line. In other words, these lights were on a particular line at the distance. She knew it was pretty far away, but she didn't know until later how far away. But they would fly along this line, and then the light would go out, and another light would appear, and it would and it would go off, and another light would appear going on this same kind of horizontal line. And she eventually concluded that it couldn't possibly be from any human agency, no person out there or people out there with flashlights in the jungle on the top of a mountain ridge running back and forth uh, with with flashlights turning off on it. It couldn't be that. Um, she never said anything about fireflies. Now, this is an entomologist. Cheeseman was a specialist in insects. If there was any possibility that these things could have been fireflies, she would have mentioned that, and she would have uh, gotten onto that immediately. Because, But these were very far away, uh, like in terms of miles away, and they were quite bright. Obviously not fireflies. Now, um, what's interesting about this is just um, a number of decades later, when my associates and I were exploring in this part of the Southwest Pacific and what's now known as Papua New Guinea, it has its own country now, its own nation. And um, we've learned things about different uh, glowing, apparent glowing pterosaurs. We believe that for sure that they're modern pterosaurs. Uh, apparently related to uh, some kind of ramparinkoid in the past, a long-tailed pterosaur. 
And they, at least some of the species, and there's more than one species of modern pterosaur in the southwest Pacific, but at least one of the species, maybe two or three, um, have the ability of, to glow. They have intrinsic bioluminescence. <coughs> I've mentioned this in my books, especially uh, Searching for Opens and Finding God, and I have the fourth edition here available if we need to get into that. See if anybody is on, on so far. Not yet. Okay. So, anyway, she was and she was really determined that she was going to stand in the same spot on that uh, porch area, the veranda. She was going to stand on that same spot in daylight and look in the same direction and determine where these lights were, where she did that. And she found out, Sorry, right, I don't have the, the precise details, but she found that there are a certain number of miles away on this mountain ridge that was in the distance. And so she, she determined it couldn't possibly be from the natives with what, what the British call a torch, we Americans call a flashlight. It couldn't be any natives with flashlights or torches, as they, she would call them. Uh, this is impossible. It was, for one thing, it was a, it was a, near the top of a ridge, which is dense jungle, you know, and it was moving horizontal lines, turning off and on. It's a, it couldn't be people with any kind of light source. It's just people can't move like that. And especially the, uh, concerning, it looked like it was uh, apparently just above the treetops. In other words, not in any, in any trail or anything. That, and there wouldn't be any trail at that area anyway for a straight line for some distance. It was not, it was not logical. It was a mystery to her. She never figured it out. Well, decades later, my associates and I learned from uh, native testimony. By the way, when Cheeseman was there and she asked the natives about it, they would, for some reason, they didn't tell her or else they kept quiet or they, they didn't want to say anything for some reason or they didn't know. But she wasn't able to learn anything from the natives. Now, in recent decades, we have gotten a lot more information from certain natives uh, in, uh, in that part of the world. Check something here. Okay. So we know that there are certain native groups and there are hundreds of languages because there's there's vastly separated little villages and groups of um, of natives in that part of the world who have different languages and, and their own little village or villages that are nearby each other have their own language it's called talk place and the talk place and language is a national language but anyway they have their own languages so they have their own names for these flying creatures that um, that we later find out are not birds. They're not bats, much, much larger than bats, but they don't have feathers, they're not birds. Uh, we have um, not just natives, but we have also Westerners, Australians and Americans who had sightings. And there are different types of sightings. Should explain that. Um, I divided into Several categories. We have a sighting of a glowing light at night, and David Wetzel, my associate, who's from um, New Hampshire, he's um, one of those who went on the expedition right after mine, a few weeks after my expedition in the year 2004. David Wetzel uh, had a good sighting of his own. This is the, the type I call the flying light observation, where he saw a flying light going approximately horizontally toward the mountain area of um, Mount Tolo, or close to Lake Pong, a crater lake on Umboy Island. And this is uh, this is uh, late in 2004, a few weeks after my expedition. And he described it and so on. We got information about that. That's one type of sighting. Many natives have that. I interviewed many. I lost count of how many natives I interviewed on Umboy Island who had seen the, the flying light. And I've gotten statistics, in fact, on my for my scientific paper that was published in a peer-reviewed journal about how the percentage of times that the flights are, are leaving the island toward the reef on, offshore and, and at what time that they'll go back from the reef offshore into the interior of the island. And it correlates with the concept that this ropen that dominates the particular island 
flies out in the early part of the night, and the first few hours of the night, and then it catches fish or whatever it catches on the reefs, and then uh, later before dawn in general, before dawn, before sun sunrise, it will come back into the island interior to one of the mountains. And it varies depending on what day it is, what mountain it goes to. It changes during course of weeks or so on. So anyway, we have that kind of sighting. It's just a, simply a glowing light. You don't see anything that produces it. You can't tell uh, what it is from observation. You could, of course, draw conclusions from the native traditions, but, you know, we'll get into that. The second kind of light... Oh, sorry. It's the second kind of sighting is that a person sees clearly the form and features of the flying creature. What's the rope and like? How big is it? Does it have feathers? Well, no, it doesn't. We have one report, for example, where there's about 10 years, approximately 10 years before I did the interview in the year 2004, which would make it in approximately 1994. Some boys went up to Lake Pong. I never quite got there myself on my expedition. I got sort of close, but never got there. Anyway, these seven boys were there in the middle of the day, and they knew about the rope, and the rope stories, the rope and legends, and so on. And, but not just minutes after they arrived at Lake Pung, this is a, it's a crater lake. Oh, it's, it's, I think it's, you would say, maybe more than half a mile the greatest length, but I, I could be mistaken. It's, it's a good-sized lake. It's not a pond, anything like a pond. It's a lake, and within minutes of their arrival, this gigantic ropen flew over the lake, not too high above the surface, but it was clearly seen. There's no obstruction, clear daylight. They saw it clearly. They were terrified. These seven boys ran home in absolute terror of their lives. Later, when I interviewed them, I learned from Gideon Coro, who was one of the three that I interviewed of those seven. I only was able to interview three of the seven eyewitnesses. <coughs> but he estimated the length of the tail was seven meters. Now, he knew a little English. He pronounces it a little differently. Seven meter. Seven meters is about 23 feet. That is definitely not a bat <laughs> Any bird that's known to science, even if there is somehow an exaggeration in this estimate. And we can, um, let me just go through some things here. We need to go through, this is Protect Animal Life is a channel. I'm Jonathan Whitcomb. And uh, most, almost all of the videos on this channel, which is well over 100 videos, are about these amazing flying creatures, apparent modern pterosaurs. And uh, I'm really excited to, to get involved and with anybody who is an eyewitness anywhere in the world. So please contact me if you have a, a sighting or you know of somebody that has had a sighting. Even if you're not sure that it really was a, a pterodactyl, feel, please feel free to contact me. Let me know about what it was. Because I've received hundreds of eyewitness reports over the last uh, 17 and a half years. And... These eyewitness reports are directly from the eyewitnesses. They're from five continents of the world. Five continents. And um, even hundreds of them from just the United States. But let's, keep, let's get going here. Keep on moving on. Okay. The URL for the uh, YouTube uh, channel. So we have the second type, which is you see the form and features. They saw the... the, 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 the Huge wings. They saw the long tail. It had a diamond-shaped structure at the end of the tail. And uh, at least two of those three eyewitnesses were very clear. There was a diamond-shaped thing at the end of the tail. I get that all over the world from people of all different cultures, backgrounds, languages, uh, beliefs. Uh, it, it's a real animal because people from all over the world, from different backgrounds and and uh, cultural uh, backgrounds have seen the same thing. It's not from some hallucination or hoaxes or, or uh, misidentifications or like that. It's, it's just there's not any animal, bird, or anything known to, to the Western science right now that's accepted broadly. I mean, my sources and I 
have no trouble with the reality of this animal. But I mean, it's except to the point where you have you know, biology textbooks that have the animal. Not yet. We don't have the rope in a biology textbook yet. So what we have is this second type of sighting, which is you can see clearly the form and features, how, about how big it is, perhaps, but mainly, you know, how the uh, how, how it has a horn at the back of the head sometimes, I would see that, and so on. But then there's the third type. That type is, uh, oh, here is a ham head, glowing pterodactyls. Is it with the CIA? No, no it's, it's nothing to do with the CIA, CIA I think. The, um, but uh, welcome, uh, glad you're here, Ham Head. Uh, feel free to ask uh, whatever questions you want or make any comments you, you feel appropriate. We have um, uh, hundreds of sightings of these glowing lights over the years, and some of them, my associates and I are convinced, are these creatures are called, many of them are called Ropen. R-O-P-E-N. Let me see if I can get something on that. This is an image. Uh, sketch. It was drawn by the eyewitness Patty Carson, who had her sighting around uh, the 1965 at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and a few years later, a, a U.S. Marine had his own sighting, which was incredible. He had his drew a sketch of that two pterodactyls, he called them. Anyway, the Ropen has a long head crest and long tail with a ramp wrinkle-like structure at the end. And this is the way things are at present, no matter what people say about ramparinkoid pterosaurs of the past. It's just, this is what we have today, is this creature that dominates the sighting reports all over the world. And I've received hundreds of these reports just myself. Keep in mind that tiny, tiny fraction of the world's population who's had a good sighting of anything like this only a tiny fraction tell me about it. There's hundreds of thousands, at least, of people around the world who had good sightings. I don't mean just some flying, I mean good sightings. They saw clearly what it was, and something like this often. This is the most common type. So we have reports of these things, and they have... Um, different results that people have in different places. But the third type, again, the third type of sighting is different from the first two, but it's a combination of them. In other words, a person sees some of the former features. They can see that it's a flying creature with wings, for example. They might see it has a tail. But they also see that the creature is glowing. In other words, like, for example, uh, Jonathan Ragu with his I don't remember as a son or daughter, but with his, he had a, a child with him, I believe. I don't think it was a grandchild. I think it was a child. And they witnessed it on the, um, this is on Umbar Island on the coast, on the northwest side, as I understand, of the coast of Umbar Island, as the creature was flying out, had a long tail. And they got a detailed interview of this man, Jonathan Ragu, from uh, my uh, friend and associate, Garth Gessman. Excellent. He gave me a copy of the forms where they get the details of all these things that they, they got for the information about it. Fascinating. I had met another native who also had this number three, three type of sighting. His name is Jonah Jim. I was a kind of hurry at the time to get off the island. I was running out of money and the boat was about to leave. I had to get out of that part of the island. So I didn't I have a, much of an interview with him, but he told me he had a sighting. He told me basically what it was. But fortunately, a few weeks later, my associates came there, Garth Gessman, David Wetzel, and they had a detailed interview with this same man, Jonah Jim. He also had this number three type of sighting. He saw the wings and the tail and so on, and he described what was glowing. He, he made an approximate uh, estimate for the size of it. It was big. And that's a long story of getting to the details of the size and how it relates to the sighting by these seven boys in daytime. But it was when the sun, I think, was either just set or it was, there was enough light he could see some things, I believe. But anyway, he could see it was glowing, but not the whole thing. Part of it was glowing as it flew overhead. He said directly overhead, I think, actually, it was a little bit to one side, not exactly um, above his head when it passed over him, but it was, it was close enough, you know, people say overhead, 
it was mostly over his head as it passed over. Because he was able to see certain details that clued me in to how he probably saw it. Anyway, um, thank you for those who've joined us here. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of many uh, live streams that we've been having. Uh, many of them are Friday late afternoon, uh, mountain time. And of course, uh, yeah, we usually conclude by about 6 or 6.30 mountain time, which would be 8 or 8.30 eastern time. And of course, there would be a, an hour difference in, in the Pacific time in, in, the, in California, for example. So this is number three subsiding. This is important. We have people in North America who've had uh, this number, not very many of them. We have some who've had this third type of sighting, which I classify related to bioluminescence, where they see the glow of the creature and they see some of the form. We don't have very many of those. That's rare. But mainly the reason I mentioned there's three types, and you say, well, how can the, uh, um, the second type, where you just see the form and features, how can that relate to bioluminescence? And, you know, they're usually in the daytime. It's not glowing. Because of the location, and uh, for example, on Lake Pum on Umboy Island, it's where these seven boys were. Daytime, of course, it's not glowing. They, they don't glow in the daytime. Ropens don't glow except at night, and it's only for a few seconds at a time. But because of the circumstances, remember this, for example, or I guess you might not know this, but I'll tell you, when I say remember, remember what I'm about to tell you. Jonah Jim was just a, a little bit south he was, uh, of Lake Pong when he was talking with me, and he climbed the coconut tree and chopped off a coconut, chopped off the top of it, so I have something to drink. I appreciated that kindness. But he he told me that it, the creature he saw, he called it rope, and of course, obviously rope into the natives, it was flying generally toward Lake Pong, and that was fairly close. This is very few kilometers away, pretty close. And that's circumstantial evidence, and I'll show you why. And just a few weeks later, when I'd already left the island and my, my other two American associates, David Wetzel and Garth Gessman, had come to that same island and started their expedition, there was a time when they were just on the other side of Lake Pong, which is the north side. I was on the south side. They were on the north side. Garth Gessman went somewhere to do something with the natives in the village, I think Mararamu village or something. And David Wetzel noticed this flying light, a incredible glowing light. He said it was, he'd never seen anything like that before. And it was flying towards the Lake Pung area and it disappeared behind a mountain. So he couldn't say for sure that it was the rope and except the circumstances uh, seem to all fit together now. Remember, uh, an American sees a strange flying light glowing toward Lake Pong, and a native, Jonah Jim, sees a, this glowing flying creature with wings and long tail, and it's glowing at night, flying toward Lake Pong. Years earlier, seven boys had been up there in the daylight and seen a gigantic roping with a long tail, which is what was described by Joan de Chim. It's not a coincidence. These things, basically, they're, they fit together. The native traditions, of course, help uh, see uh, some possibilities. The natives say that it is the flying creature. The rope and does glow at night. And people see them. Well, couldn't it have been something else? Could it be maybe an airplane? Airplanes are illegal at night in Papua New Guinea. And if it wasn't, the pilots wouldn't fly much at night anyway, except the main airliners, you know, into the airport. That's different. But the small planes, no. You don't fly over a jungle at night uh, in that part of the world. It's, just, it's even if it was legal. And also, the perspective that people have is that this is a low flying light. It's flying low, just a little bit above the, the treetops of the jungle, jungle canopy. Now, do we have anybody here yet uh, that's joined us in the chat? Yeah, we do have Ilya Kovalchuk, thank you for coming back, Ilya. Glad you're back with us. 
Quetzalcoatlus or the biggest flying creature ever? Is there any possibility that they might be alive still? Well, definitely a possibility. But I wouldn't count too much on that specific uh, type. Um, in other words, of all the pterosaurs that have lived in the past, now yeah, there's different people have different ideas about when they lived. The, the, the common one in Western countries it was many millions of years ago. My associates, I in general, most of us, we don't believe it was that long ago. But here's the point: however long ago it was that pterosaurs were common around the world, and they're common meaning, uh, I mean, there are many more of them then than now. There are not nearly so many species. Most of them have died. They're mostly extinct. Uh, why do I say that? Because I, my whole 18 years almost of this research has been around the point of living pterosaurs, modern pterodactyls, as people call them. Why do I say the vast majority of these flying creatures are extinct? Because, think about it, we have so many people in the world and so many people out, even at night, if there were, if all the pterodactyls, <laughs> people call them, were still alive, we would have them, we would see them, we would, we would classify them like owls and, and crows and pigeons and so on. We'd, we'd know them and we'd, we'd have them in biology books, you know, they'd be discovered. No, they're, they're at least uncommon and there are very few species compared with the past. So the possibility that a modern pterosaur that is really close to a Quetzalcoatlus is not too good. It's just a matter of possible probabilities. And that doesn't mean that we don't have any of that size. Now, that's a different question. Uh, Ilya, we do have sighting reports that are very clear, that including a sighting, uh, sighting by a scientist in 1997 at Perth, Australia, in December of 1997. And it's very clear that was extremely large, the size of many Quetzalcoatl uh, pterosaurs. But it wasn't that type. It was a long tail type. We get this over and over again, that the long tails dominate. When I did a statistical analysis of this, oh, let's get a picture back up here. This is the uh, image it was sketched by Eskin Kuhn just minutes after his sighting at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba in 1971, which was just a few years after the sighting by Patty Carson, who also drew a sketch, which is, where is it now? This one, yeah. Patty Carson drew this sketch. Um, these are long tails. We call them ropens. Ropen is a long tail modern pterosaur. It has a ramparinquoid-like uh, structure at the end of the tail. I did some analysis of statistics and so on. I learned some very interesting things. These, these sighting reports in general are not from hoaxes. These, these details in the analysis, they prove it. It's not from hoaxes. There may be one or two, possibly at the most, out of 128 that were studied of these sightings. But it had no major contribution to the, to the, to the thing. It's not a major contamination of the, of the data. Anyway, I found that the, the ratio of long-tailed uh, modern pterosaurs that people see to um, long tails to those that don't have long tails, it's like about 20 to 1. Well, exactly 19 to 1 or 21 to 1, but it was a huge ratio difference. The long tails just dominate. Now, and, and since the since, uh, beginning of 2013, I've had a lot more of sighting reports. Is, is I, I haven't counted them up in that detail, but i just tell you my impression is that the ratio is not quite that much, and the actual animals themselves, that is these flying creatures themselves, they do not have that actual population difference with long tails and those that don't have long tails. It's not that. People notice the long tails more because that's one of the factors that causes a person to turn their head, is that something flies by with a long tail. That influences the concept of that, what the animal population is, because that's part of what causes a person to look at it is a long tail. Or let me put it this way. This is more accurate. When you glance at something flying by, thinking, well, that must be a bird, you know, and it doesn't have a long tail, you might not pay much attention to it, even if it's a pterodactyl, because at a distance, it might not look that different than a bird. 
But if it has a very long tail and a structure at the end of the tail, that's different. Then you will stop what you were doing and you will keep looking at it, which means the very the very presence of a long tail will influence how many people see it. More people will see it. They'll they'll look at it longer. So even though the, the statistics might show a 10 to 1 ratio of long tails to not long tails, that doesn't actually tell us precisely what the ratio is in the actual animals themselves. And in other words, what the populations are like. It doesn't tell us exactly that because that factor skewers the uh, a little bit, at least skewers the, the percentages. Okay, let's see if we got anybody else coming here to the chat. Okay, thank you for coming. For those that uh, are with us, I'm going to just check briefly, see how many. Okay, we've gotten up to about eight, at least eight persons participating now. Feel free, feel free to contact us and uh, make a comment if you like. And we've been doing this a few weeks with these live chats. I'm not sure I'm going to continue this on Tuesdays. Don't expect us to keep on on Tuesdays, but Friday nights we're pretty sure we should keep to this schedule, which is about beginning 4 or 4.30 uh, Mountain Time, Utah Time, and ending about an hour or two later, sometimes over two hours. So we have a long way to go. Well, this is the thing about glowing pterosaurs. We have a number of sightings in North America, and some of these, including marfolites, uh, I believe are related, at least somehow, to the ropens. And Ilya also says, I like those with a long tail and a diamond at the end, but my favorite would be pteranodons. They just look so cool. Yeah, you know, they're commonly featured in films, you know, in movies and television, um, which is one reason it kind of points against the idea that people are just reporting things from their imagination or making hoaxes or things based upon their concepts of, of pterodactyls. Or, but technically, it's the correct word is pterosaur, of course, if you're a scientist. You want to keep away from usually with words like pterodactyl because it's a long story. It gets messed up. People call them pterodactyl. They mean pterosaur. But there are two general types, one long tail and one that has... Um, either no apparent tail that's easily seen, or it has a shorter tail. And there's other structural differences, too, generally, between those two general kinds of pterosaurs. Pteranodon is a different type than a ropen. And uh, some of them were, were getting really big in the past, and we do have some reports that strongly suggest that there are some modern pterosaurs that are not ropens. They do not have that long tail. They don't have the structure at the end of the tail either. They're not ropens, but they can grow to be very big too. We have those sightings. Um, so let's talk about this bioluminescence. At Mar and the Marfa Lights in Texas, there's a little town out in the south, uh, Presidio County, I think it is, something like that, in uh, South, a little bit the western side of Texas, not that many miles from, from the Mexican border, but they have sightings of these strange lights. Now we have to be aware that there are a number of different types of lights that people see when they go there. They're looking for the marfa lights. I want to see these mystery marfa lights. Nobody knows what they are. So they go there and they see something strange, and it's a strange light. They say, I saw it, I saw it. Well, the chances are probably they got a certain uh, visual effect, it's not exactly a normal mirage, but it was, they saw there's a certain high, a highway that runs runs through that general area. And I think as I remember, it's, <coughs> it's a highway to the, to the west of where the, the more incredible lights are seen. And people look there, off to their right, from there on the, this structure, this was built so that you can stand there and and look out over the this uh, plain, and they look more to the right and they see these strange lights you know, coming down this particular direction. Yeah, those are car headlights. Uh, nothing really strange about them, except sometimes the visual effects in the atmosphere will do things, you know, and they look weird. But that's not the real marfa lights that have been studied by the scientist James Bunnell, and. Um, 
I highly recommend that since the first edition of the book, I think there's a second, maybe a third edition. Uh, this research was done, and I've analyzed the statistics from this, uh, certain things that um, have come up that I found to be very important for my research. These flying lights that are really significant, that are just totally not the car headlights, and they're not any other kind of lights, not satellites and flying through the sky or anything like that. They're not meteors, no. They're flying low to the ground, just a few feet above the ground. And James Bunnell, he's a scientist on the space program way back when men were landing on the moon. Um, he was going with the opinion, and also, as far as I know, if he's still living, I presume he's still living, he's still keeping to this idea that there's some kind of non-living uh, energy force in the ground, and somehow it relates maybe to something that happens perhaps with Earth movement, uh, tectonic plates, you know, that kind of thing, some kind of way that makes these lights. But the actual detailed uh, pondering on the de what happens with these lights in all different circumstances indicates to me these are extremely likely to be uh, bioluminescence. They're flying creatures that are predators that work together as a group, uh, if you call them a flock or whatever. They work together as a group and they and they use hunting skills that they've developed and they will spend one night, possibly two nights in a row, in this part of Texas and they will use their bioluminescent glow to catch things if it's warmer weather, there will be probably, apparently, from what I can tell, it's bats. They will make a glow which will attack the insects, which will attack the bats. I, it's theoretical, of course. It's theoretical, but it makes sense, the way that the lights behave. Let me give you an example, okay? I might have said this on another live stream, but I think it bears repeating if I have. Give you an example. And these strange, weird flying lights, the real mystery lights of Marfa, Texas. Let me tell you, these are really weird. There will be, and many people have witnessed this. Most of them probably have no idea that, that, that somebody in California, well, I used to live in California, I live in Utah now, but somebody back west would have written many books about uh, modern pterosaurs, and including a, a, some of one book about uh, <coughs> Marfa lights being related to Glowing pterodactyls. Hey, Jonathan uh, Leonard Smith. Thank you so much for joining us. Have you been here before? I don't recall your name. You may have been here once. I don't, I rec I don't recognize your name offhand, but thank you for being here. Anyway, a light will appear glowing, and the research of the scientist James Bunnell indicates that these lights generally just a few feet above the ground. They're not car headlights from the trucks that the ranchers use at night. This is a strange light. The light will seem to divide in half. And one light will lead... Uh, this is a common thing. It happens uh, not, not not all the time. It does happen. Yeah, well, thank you for, for coming, coming again, Leonard. Leonard Smith is here. So it, it, one light will leave... It seems like the light divides into two, and that one other light will, one or the other, left or right, whatever, wherever you're looking at it, the light will leave, travel a considerable distance. I mean, a long way. As I recall, one case it was over half a mile, I'm pretty sure, well over half a mile, if I remember right. Long distance. Then it will come back. What is going on? What was that? It's like the people call that, you know, this dancing ghosts or something. There's nothing. I've, I've pondered this. I've looked into this trying to figure out, is there any possibility that there's some non-living energy field in the ground that would cause a light a little above the ground, and then that light would break into two, and one light would stay where it was, and the other light would travel a long distance and then come back? No, there's no non-living explanation, no energy force, nothing in the ground, no magnetism, no gravity, nothing like that would cause that kind of uh, phenomenon. It's just, it's just only one possibility. There's some kind of intelligence involved there. In other words, the people that live there, the, I wouldn't call them natives, you know, Texans that live in that area, the ranchers and others, they just, they just instinctively know that is 
there's some kind of intelligence there, and they're correct. I'm, I'm convinced. Not necessarily that there's a pterosaur. It's not necessarily mean that. We don't have enough sightings and details about people seeing pterodactyls um, in that area. We do have some, but not enough that I can say, oh, definitely a pterodactyls are doing this. It's just one possibility because we know that there are pterosaurs in some parts of the world who do that do glow at night, at least for a few seconds at a time. Anyway, that light would come back, and there is an explanation for it, not necessarily the only explanation. I'm just saying this one. And that comes from this fact that I found in the book. This is an extremely uh, detailed book done by a scientist, James Bunnell, who does not believe, I told him my ideas, he doesn't believe them. He doesn't believe me. He's not trying to promote modern pterodactyls. No, not at all. He doesn't believe me. But he's got a, a accumulated an incredible number of, this, of these details and what he's observed and photographed, videotaped over many years from these cameras that have triangulated the direction so he can tell what direction. He's a scientist. He knows what he's doing. He arranged these cameras and got permission from the ranchers there, became friends with them. He's, he's local. He's, he's originally local from that area of Texas. He became friends with people and got their permission to set up these things, these cameras and things, um, in that part of the plain of this part of Texas. And he's seen these these how the how the lights go, and he's he's taken track. He kept kept track of when the particular sightings happened and what happened in the sightings. Well, I got into that book and I looked at the details, finding, oh, he keeps track of temperatures. Well, times of the year, spring, summer, fall, winter. I found some things that he wouldn't find because so easily because I, I'm looking at possibility that this is a intelligent behavior of, of flying predators that act in a group. <coughs> when that light seems to divide, it, it never divides. It's always two. It was always two. Even when there was no light there, there were two flying creatures hovering a few feet off the ground. They turn on their bioluminescent grow, which is intrinsic, meaning they have control of the light. They turn, one of them at least turns on the, the glow. The other one would turn on the glow flying close to it. They're close together to do this hunting routine. It's, I know it's kind of incredible. Not going to be so intelligent. But there are some predators in the world that are extremely intelligent. And actually, for example, some big cats in Africa are just you know, off the top of my head. They're extremely intelligent. They were doing extremely intelligent things with, with hunting and so on. Anyway, when they divide, it seemed to divide, and the light seemed to divide, and one flying away, it actually always was two flying creatures. Always was. Whether they had the lights on or not. And what happened when one of those flying creatures took off a certain distance, the other one continued to glow. The bats that would be in that area might notice that one of them had flown away, so they'll feel a little bit more brave and catching insects and those are this is probably i say i believe it's the aptesicus fuscus the big brown bat which is uh, found in many areas including this part of texas the aptesicus aptesicus fuscus or something like that you know, the brown big brown bat it will get a little closer to this what they know is a predator or feels scared of it it will get a little closer because one of them's flown away and it will catch the insects that are around the light, like it does when it's around a, a for example, a, a, a porch light at a ranch, for example, and then the bats will come to catch the insects there. Well, as they start to feel more comfortable, start to, several bats are flying around catching the insects around this light from this glowing creature, which may or may not be a pterosaur, or some kind of glow, uh, flying creature, bird or whatever. The other one, comes back, and if I understand, it will not have the light on. The light will be off at that time. It will turn off its light before it gets there. <laughs> we'll grab a bat, I'm sure. Pretty sure. And there's, as sure as you can be with a speculation like this, but I think that's what happened, because if you look at the temperatures, you notice that something interesting. Okay, uh, this is Leonard Smith. Where in Texas is Marfa located? It's 
sorry, I don't have a picture right handy. It's uh, um, it's southern Texas, and it's kind of more to the west side, but very much southern, and it's a uh, uh, desert area where they have a lot of cattle, cattle ranchers and so on. And I don't remember how far it is from the Mexican border, not that far. Like I don't, know, I don't remember how many miles it is, but it's not that far. It's pretty far south. Small town. You you can find it though. You you look on the Google map. But anyway, if you look at statistics on this from this book, it's uh, it's seen that when the temperature goes down. Now this is usually, of course, in the colder times of year, of course. But if you just look at the temperatures, the temperature goes down. You still have the sightings. They still occur, but they do not have that characteristic of two lights splitting in half and then another coming back and then turning off. It does not have that characteristic. Why? Well, it, I'm still speculating, you understand. This is, but listen, it, it makes sense because if you have the cooler time of year, you don't have the insects, nearly as many, if there are any, probably none. And so there'll be no reason for the flying creatures to hunt like that. So you don't see any of that behavior in the cooler temperatures. What you do see is certain things where they'll go off and they'll be like what looks to me like they're just hunting for something. I don't know if it's rabbits or the a peccary, that kind of a wild pig sort of like animal that is native to this part of the world. That's uh, um, Abelina. What is it called? Um, it's the... Um, Avelina, you know, peccary, different names. But they, um, they might feed on them, uh, uh, digging up rattlesnakes, uh, avelinas, uh, whatever they can find in the holes. Now, this is what's important, I believe, too. After one night or possibly two nights in a row of this incredible, strange activity of these weird lights that, can't, uh, that have not been explained by scientists in general, to their satisfaction is any kind of, I mean, anyway, they, they're they very weird. After the first night and possibly the next night they might come back, but then they don't come back at all for a long time. It could be quite a few weeks. In a typical year, you have about something like six of these events per year. That means you can go through many weeks, perhaps without any activity, you don't have them three or four nights in a row. You don't have that kind of activity. You have them one night or two nights, and then they're gone for a while. Well, it makes sense from my perspective on this uh, conjecture or hypothesis that these are bioluminescent frying creatures because <coughs> these predators come out at night hunting jackrabbits, uh, peccaries, bats, whatever it is at that particular time of year when they're out. <clears throat> but they will soon get the easy stuff, the easy prey that they can catch fairly easily, and then they just move on to another area of North America, which could be Mexico, I'm sure, some other area, probably different places in Mexico, because we do have a lot of reports in Mexico of pterodactyls, and some people are in Mexico, they're, they're really scared of them. They're dangerous, apparently. But uh, in remote areas of Mexico, and they're nocturnal. So anyway, that's what we have with Marfa. I did some other studies, uh, but yeah, glowing. Oh, this is Anon El Cachalote. Did I pronounce that right? Thank you for coming here. I don't think you've been here before, have you? Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate you coming. <clears throat> yeah, glowing. And different parts of the world have different characteristics. Different Jones Senior, if you look at the western section of Texas, the lobe or whatever you call it, the western panhandle, yeah, you could say, well, Marfa is about in the center of that section. I've been there all. Oh, you've been there. Great. Yeah, it's 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 um this very small towns, if I understand, not too, too much out there. It's you know, little cattle ranches. They're common. Yeah, and then he, Clifford also says, I've been there to Marfa and have seen the lights. There's a viewing station. The viewing station is um, 
made specially so people can go there at night and look out there. And there are different kinds of lights people see, apparently. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, th or thank you, Leonard. Thank you very much. Oh, it says, thank you, sir, to Clifford. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, Clifford says, J, J Station. Um, yeah, the viewing station makes it easy to have some place to, to watch the, the desert out there at night. And some of the lights, as I mentioned a little earlier tonight, are may appear mysterious. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for, for participating, and Anon. Uh, yeah, they, they appear mysterious because certain conditions, when there's a highway there, the cars will drive out there at night and the headlights on, of course. And certain conditions will cause a strange effect, which make them look kind of weird. They don't look like head, car headlights. But that's what they are. Generally, the most mysterious, real mystery lights of Marfa only happen about six times a year, so you have to be really lucky to get those. Um, okay, Anand said, first time here, found you on the related Ken Hovens videos. Oh, Ken Hovens. Now I can tell you, he's the one, oh, maybe 18, 19 years ago, that got me interested in, in the, this research. I appreciate uh, Ken Hovind uh, for getting me into this. Um, uh, anyway, that's a long story. <laughs> um, so we have these lights that are not mis that mysterious, and they have a common explanation, car headlights. But you also have these that have been observed uh, and recorded by cameras, triangulated in three different cameras by a scientist over a period of many years, and seen that they are very weird. They travel just a few feet above the ground, is the ground just a few feet above the ground and they act in strange ways they have characteristics in the light it's like a weird it's not anything come much 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 brighter than any firefly much 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 brighter and they and they travel too fast much faster than fireflies can fly they're really like um faster than most birds fly as i recall but not like an airplane, not that journey that fast. But this scientist, uh, James Bunnell, he just assumes that it's some kind of energy force. He's always going with that assumption. And so the Houston Chronicle, which published a newspaper from a press release I gave years ago, and the, the Houston Chronicle is one of the biggest newspapers in the country, maybe number two or number three in the whole United States. And they did an article about my theories or ideas about what causes Marfa lights, and generally they, the, the, the lady that was the reporter for that, <clears throat> she made a big mistake, and instead of getting a biologist to look into my ideas about biology, she got some people who were not biologists and were in another branch or branches of science, and they got them, and they had their, their ideas or their theories, which was non-biological, because they're not biologists, of course, so... <laughs> She concluded that they were right and I was wrong, you know. It's, it's generally common. I've gotten this from newspapers in the United States for decades. I understand this, what's going on. And I'm, I'm not saying it's a very bad thing that they're approaching us. It has to do with culture. We have certain weaknesses in uh, Western culture, including the United States. And it's just the, where we live. We live here. And people have certain attitudes, you know, all dinosaurs and pterosaurs became extinct many, many millions of years ago. So this is kind of ingrained in our thinking since early childhood and constantly repeated, repeated over and over again. Oh, they've been dead for 65 million years or whatever, 66, 65 and a half. They keep changing the little details and get it precise when they all died. But the point is really... That's not, there's no evidence for absolute extinction of a general type of, of animal or, or bird. There's nothing scientific about saying, oh, all species of a general type, like dinosaurs, or you could say pterosaurs, all their species must be extinct millions of years ago. There's nothing scientific about that. Nothing at all. It's just speculation. Okay, and Clifford Jones, Sr., as I remember, the lights were in a dim reddish color and seemed to float down the slopes of the mountains there. Sorry for my previous typos. Oh, no problem. Yeah, and I and I can't say from, you know, just that description you give, I can't say if that was a more mysterious type or not. 
I'm just saying that there are two explanations, but and then Anand says those people's brains have been dead for 60 million. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we sympathize with your thoughts there, Anand, yeah. The, um, the thing is, it sounds weird, and I know there's another newspaper in Texas at the time, many years ago, <coughs> they're extremely sarcastic, you know, glowing dinosaurs flying over Texas, you know, and of course, <laughs> you're making little distortions at each one. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. Glowing, you know, they glow, you know, but they're not you know, dinosaurs, of course. They're pterosaurs. They're winged animals with wings. But that's just one possibility in the general um, hypothesis that these are uh, flying predators that act as a group at, at night to catch whatever they catch on the desert. But I, I still submit that this is the best explanation anybody's come up with. Uh, the weird as it sounds, um, if you have a light, and it's not made by anything like living, not by any animal or bird or anything like that. It's just some kind of energy force. Somehow the ground makes, some energy comes up out of the ground and it makes a light a few feet above the ground. And that light divides in two. It will never result, that energy force would never result in one light flying away while the other one stays there. Makes no sense at all. And then later the other flying light will come back. Ah, no. There's no energy force that acts in that weird way. It just doesn't. If, if it's, if that type of thing is a, is something intelligently directed, some kind of purposeful activity. Something's going on there. I, I The best I can tell, it's and that happens in the warmer weather, you know, when we have a higher temperatures where you have insects and then the the, uh, the big brown bat of that part of Texas, it will catch insects at night and they will go to lights. And these are lights, you know, weird as they are, they are lights. The bats should go there in warmer weather to catch insects that will be around the light. It all makes sense. Um, it sounds extraordinary that... that those flying creatures could be that intelligent to do that, but it's not the exception. There are animals in the world, predators, that have incredible technique for hunting as a group. Incredible. Even small ones. And Don't dismiss it just because it seems that nothing uh, other than humans can be that intelligent. <laughs> there is very great intelligence in many predators. Um, we could go into details, if you like, about uh, certain hunting techniques. And it's not really the best example, perhaps, but in, in certain big cats like the lion in Africa, as I recall, yeah, well, I think the lions, they will have some animals go out in a long way around and just wait while one or more other lions will attack a herd of whatever they're attacking, you know whatever it is, and that causing that herd of the prey to run toward the one or two or so lions that are waiting for them. You know, lions, they can't communicate, you know, in, in English or German or French, you know, it's plan out this thing in the language. I don't know, they, they do it, and it works. I, I don't speculate about how that came to be, but it's just an intelligent behavior. It's a habit. They they know that it works, so they keep with the good habits. If it works, you keep you keep doing it. Get back to some other things. So this, I'm Jonathan Whitcomb. For those new, you come here on the Protect Animal Life uh, YouTube channel. These live streams generally are, are on Friday late afternoons and into the evening, depending on your time zone in the United States or elsewhere. It would be very different course, and this is the contact form, so you can communicate with me by email. When you do communicate with this form, you do need to just stick to the basics for the first time, but just send your, fill out the very simple short form, and, and that will be coming to me as an email. And then when I email you back, then we can communicate with regular emails, and we can include uh, attachments, images, photos, whatever you want to send me, or uh, continue without having any kind of form to fill out, or that's once-only form. 
And the full title of this is Glowing Pterodactyl Mystery. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Glowing Pterodactyl Mystery Lights at Night. <coughs> and we started with uh, uh, that's the URL of the channel on YouTube. We started with uh, accounts by the insect scientist, entomologist, Evelyn Cheeseman, in, in a particular book she wrote in the early 20th century, <coughs> at least in the 1930s, as I recall. And she had a sighting of these mysterious flying lights, and it significant details lead me to be sure that what she saw were living pterosaurs that were glowing with intrinsic bioluminescence at night in the deep in the interior of the island of New Guinea, which is one of the largest islands in the world. Dense tropical rainforest, dense areas of difficult to travel through the jungles. So we do have other accounts too in um, Yakima River, a southeastern Washington state, for example, where we've had uh, these strange flying lights. And I've been to the area at daytime with two of the people that have observed them. <coughs> and it looks like an ordinary river there in southeastern uh, Washington state. And they have, um, at nighttime, at least they used to, there's somebody has been shooting off a gun now at night. That's horrible thing to do. Well, they might not be flying there anymore, but they are flying in another area of that part of the country at night over a different river. But <clears throat> in that case, you can say, well, maybe it's something else and not a pterodactyl. Well, yeah, except if you learn a little more, you find out that in the tree that my two friends uh, and associates told me they had seen a light fly out and fly down over the river. You know, this particular tree on the bank of the river. In daylight, another man had been driving past. There's a, a road right past it. He'd drive past, and he saw a pterodactyl in that tree. The same tree where other people have seen a flying light take off from the tree, the same tree, and go over the river like it was fishing. I don't think it's a coincidence. No. These are related to the Ropen of Umbo Island to some degree or another, and this might be related to the uh, more mysterious of the Marfa lights uh, that are seen about six times, more or less six times a year uh, in that part of southern Texas. Now, there are other places that do have strange lights. I had many years ago uh, uh, interviews, mostly by emails, but sometimes probably by telephone with a Susan Wooten from South Carolina. Susan had a wonderful sighting. Don't have the image here. She drew a rough sketch. It's not nearly as good as, as these sketches uh, and, um, that these uh, eyewitnesses have sketched. Uh, Patty Carson and, and Eskin Kuhn are really talented artists, so they can really make precise sketches of what they observed. But, but Susan Wooten just drew a crude sketch. She had a sighting in the day in the daytime in South Carolina, in the remote rural area, farmland area and swamps and so on, as I recall. And and so she saw a huge pterodactyl, long tail. And then she remembered after she we'd been communicating for or maybe years, we'd been communicating for a while, maybe a few months perhaps, but she remembered there's another place in South Carolina, she's been there. And there's a place where they have these flying lights at night. They're called the um, Bingham lights. B-I-N-G-H-A-M? Bingham? Something like that. Bingham lights. And she related to me some things. She had experiences there and going there and seeing these strange lights flying through the swamp, just over the surface of the, the, of the water, apparently, uh, in the swamp. And uh, I thought that's interesting. Possibly they're... Uh, same phenomenon, the bioluminescence of, this, of the same creature. And there are other places in the United States where they have strange glowing lights. Now, not all of them, by far, are, are, are pterosaurs. Some of them, for example, 
and they're there. I don't remember offhand all these different names. Each different location in North America, especially in the United States, they'll have they'll have this flying light at night that people see sometimes, and they'll they'll give it a name, whatever they give it according to their location or some legend about some headless uh, man that got hit by a train or something, whatever. Uh, but the, sometimes you would get a detail like. For example, that shows that this light is flying like a like a like a, a bird or something is flying, and and the behavior I tell I pay attention to the behavior. Because, if the description of that flying light, is similar to how a barn owl, that's like Tito Alba, barn owl, how a barn owl flies hunting at night. If it's similar, that's what it is, a barn owl that glows. Yes. Let me show. Oh, I don't have the book in front of me. I don't want to leave the camera to go get my book about um, the Min Min lights. I have it right here on my shelf, but I, I think it's wrong to 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 leave a, a blank screen here. I, I have to be here, but I'll tell you what I remember. The Min Min lights could be a number of things depending on who saw what and when they saw it and how, what it looked like. But generally, it comes down to this: the book author. Uh, Silcock, as I remember, Mr. Silcock, something Silcock. Uh, he did research for a long time, and he's come to the conclusion, I do too, that there are certain barn owls that have the capability of bioluminescence, intrinsic, uh, I, I, we believe, if I remember his writings on that. I haven't read his book lately, but basically, it's not just modern pterosaurs that fly at night and glow at night. No, the, at least some barn owls do, but generally with the barn owls, it's not our, all barn owls necessarily have this capability, and they only use it now in modern times in extreme emergencies when they are like near starvation or something, and then they will sit somewhere and they, they will start glowing to attract insects, and then they will peck the insects, and they're just they'll survive long enough to avoid a, a starvation. And this has been observed as behavior on at least one occasion in um, Australia when a man was in his backyard and they had a swimming pool and a, a, a dive board on the, over the swimming pool and he saw some glowing light on the dive, dive board. And he got closer and saw that it was, the light started getting dimmer and he saw it was a what they call a great owl in Australia, a barn owl. It was this big owl, and it was pecking insects that had landed on the diving board, and it stopped glowing. I take that as strong uh, evidence that, that the ideas of Mr. Silcock are correct. Now, <coughs> now I do say possibly that the bioluminescent capacity of barn owls in general has been mostly lost, perhaps, over the last centuries or thousands of years, whatever. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's the way you want to call it, barn owls have been very successful across many areas of the, of the world. Not all areas, some tropical areas not, but in many areas they were very successful. I believe that over many, many centuries, Barn owls have learned to hunt so well and use certain skills that they have and certain abilities, hearing, for example, other things. They've learned to hunt so well at night that they no longer really need this uh, bioluminescent process, which might involve some kind of perhaps a chemical that gets secreted on the some of the feathers or not. But anyway, what, whatever's involved, they don't need it so much so that you hardly ever see a barn owl glowing and when you have them in captivity in the zoo, for example, of course the zookeepers are never going to see it glowing because they don't keep barn owls on a starvation diet. They're not going to starve a barn owl. No way. They're going to feed it. So why in the world should it glow? It takes energy, some kind of biological resources, uh, I believe, in the production. And now, if you say, well, that is too weird, glowing barn owls. Well, that is so weird. I never heard of that before. Well... Listen to a little bit more. Why do, does the barn owl 
have white feathers on the underside of the wings. Why in the world would a nocturnal flying creature like the barn owl have on the underside of the wings white feathers? I mean, it, it, it could turn off, it could be seen so easily sometimes by a mouse that happens to be out at night, and all of a sudden the, the barn owl comes with the big wings and there's white on the underside of the wings, it's all white. What in the world is going on there is because it's not too many centuries ago when the barn owl would rely on the bioluminescence, and they had white because it allows the light to go through. The light can get through the, the feathers and it can use the bioluminescence for whatever it used to use it for, and apparently not much anymore, but someplace in the United States they have reports of these strange flying lights that I don't think are pterosaurs. No, they move like hunting barn owls. Sometimes you have two of them, two lights that are flying together, and they move. There's a certain pattern to, to um, barn owl behavior, the way they fly. Yeah, long trailing tail is a giveaway there. Yeah, there's a rope and long tail. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us, Wide Gauge. Thank you for coming back again. And it looks like your image there is looks like something like an owl. Is that right? I don't suppose it's a barn owl, maybe? Anyway, I like that image. Cool. We're just talking about barn owls. <laughs> I'm glad you're with us, Wide Gauge. Um, anyway. The, uh, there are certain traits in the pattern of how barn owls hunt at night. They will fly in certain ways, certain ways that they go back and forth and not too fast. And they will go not too high above the ground, generally. And um, I believe that when you have part of the United States, wherever it is, that people report this strange glowing light, I believe that these are certain barn owls, Tidal Alba, or, or sim similar to Tidal Alba, that still have this capacity that's been pat that, was, that was more common in many centuries ago. They still have the capacity to glow, and for whatever reason, they're using that bioluminescent capacity, because they do look... Um, so glad you're here, Wide Gauge. They do look like they fly like barn owls. I think that's what they are. But then there are other cases the North Carolina area is one weird place, a certain mountain. I don't think there, there's nothing like barn owls. They don't fly like that. And I understand some people say it's a UFOs, but no, not in Marfa, Texas. I don't think there'd be any intelligent uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, beings that would come here to our planet and for whatever, however they do it, whenever they come here. And then six times a year, just pass a few feet over the ground in Marfa, Texas area, as if they're hunting rattlesnakes. I don't. It's not very intelligent for people that can, beings that can, that can, that can travel to different galaxies and stars. And uh, they wouldn't be hunting rattlesnakes and cut rat, jackrabbits uh, in the middle of the night in a remote desert in Marfa area. Mm -mm. No, they're they're um, normal flying predators happened to have uh, gotten a very intelligent way of acting together to hunt together. Oh, so I have been more uh, better prepared. We could go into some things in Papua New Guinea here. And that is, I, I learned in my expedition a lot of things, but one of the things I learned was that the ropen, and it's generally a single large big ropen, that will spend the day on a particular whatever mountain it happens to be in close to that day. And then when the sun sets at night, it will fly from that mountain to the closest, I presume, the closest reef, whichever reef is closest on the, on, out, off the shore of Humboldt Island. The reef is really, reefs are really close to the island. They're close. And it will go there and catch fish, perhaps a giant clam, which sometimes it will gab. But this uh, ropen has a particular type of bioluminescence. It, it can control when it turns it on, and I know we may have gone over this before, but it has the ability to turn on the glow a particular time when it needs to land on a particular tree, for example, on a peninsula uh, 
on the northern side. You can look around the map if you want. You probably find that little peninsula in a, um, a NASA a satellite image of Umboy Island in Papua New Guinea that will land on a particular tree near the end of that peninsula. And as soon as it lands there, the light will go off, according to the natives. The light will go off. Then later, the light will come on when it goes down to the reef to, we presume, to catch fish or whatever it eats. Um, so that's what the natives observe in that part of the island. Now, we learned that not from my particular expedition, but a few weeks after my expedition, the two Americans that came after me, and they were in the, in the northern part where I didn't go. And they got to talk to natives in that area and learn about these things that the natives know about it. But one of the things that the, the Ropen would use <coughs> with the bioluminescence, it will turn it on as it's about to land on the tree branch or whatever it lands on on that particular tree. <coughs> and then the light will go off. Now this we need to consider, and I'll give you my opinion. I, I feel pretty strongly that the Ropen does not actually turn off the light. He can't decide when it goes off. It just, his, his secretion on his skin or whatever it is that he uses to cause that glow, it's basically used up that chemical that causes that glow. And so it has to wait wherever it is until his body can, can produce the new secretion or whatever it is, new to, to glow again. And it only lasts for five or six seconds now. The two natives I talked to, David Moke and William Gima, estimated five seconds. Uh, Gibson, uh, who talked to the other Americans uh, a few weeks later, said five to six seconds, which is practically the same thing. I mean, natives don't normally have a stopwatch, you know, that they are timing things, but they know about different things like time and distance and so on. <clears throat> and this correlates with what was seen by Evelyn Cheeseman, the scientist, the British entomologist who explored uh, decades earlier, um, quite a few decades earlier, and, and by that Southwest Pacific on the mainland of New Guinea, when she said she estimated the time that the glow took place was four to five seconds, which is close enough, close enough. I believe what she saw were uh, ropens that were at least related, if not the same species, as the Ropa Nuomboy Island that I um, questioned natives about in the year 2004. I think it's could be the same species or closely related. Anyway, so in that case, it makes sense. What happens is that the Ropen has the ability to turn on the glow, but it just glows brightly until it's all gone and there's nothing left. It has to wait for a while before it can turn it back on again. He doesn't wasted, I don't think, only if he really needs the glow. And But once he starts it, it can't, I don't think it can stop. They don't, I, don't, I haven't heard anybody tell me that the glow for one second or two seconds, and it just doesn't happen. And it doesn't go for eight seconds or more, it just doesn't happen either. So it makes sense. It, it has an ability to turn on that glow and push out that secretion or whatever is onto the skin, which will produce that whatever reaction is that causes the glow. And then it just glows until it's gone. But I do think that there is very, very likely something more precise here that's possible with the ropens. That, for example, this one ropen that has lived on Umbo Island for so long, it's basically it was controlling it. If it's not already still there, or taken over by another ropen that kicked it out. Um, it has the um, that similar kind of ability that others do, but the rope in itself is, is not the only one that's ever there. Occasionally there will be another rope and large rope, and often it's not always large and smaller, that will come in and possibly breeding might be done. There might be baby ropens possibly in the jungles and not seen much. I don't know. I don't know if it's a male or female that's up there. It's been on that island for so long, and it's not necessarily the same one as in the year 1949, when I questioned an old man who was probably just a boy at that time. 
1949 in Gumblagon Village when a glowing light light came down to the to the graveyard and it, um, it a man had just recently been buried there and they, the, that tradition there was they cover the graves with leaves leaves I don't remember the Kovai language word for leaves but uh, it's it's leaves and um, so the rope and of course easily push away the leaves and got the body and when they came back in the morning they saw that the the grave is opened and the body is gone well they knew what happened i mean they had eyewitnesses saw the light come to the grave that's not the normal diet of a ropen however and it's probably not the same ropen at that time in 1949 as in around 1994 when uh, those uh, seven boys saw the roping in daylight with a tail length of about seven meters, according to that one estimate. And that's, it could be an exaggeration, you know. It's not necessarily that long, but you know it's very long. If the if, uh, uh, eyewitness estimates uh, 23 feet long, you know that it's, it, even if it's less than 23 feet, it's a long tail. But anyway, the... Uh, the point is, it's not necessarily the same animal. There could be another one, or two other ones, that have come in and taken over the territory, push the other one out, force the other one to leave, uh, get less productive area to, to survive on. <coughs> and the one seen by Jonathan Ragu, which was glowing, and you could see the wings and the tail, and it was glowing as it took off at, that night from the northwest corner of the shore, the coast of Amboy Island, not too many years before my expedition there, actually. It was not that many years ago, uh, compared with, you know, when our expeditions were in, in the year 2004. But that was a smaller one, so you can't say, well, that the roping of Amboy had gone off to, to try to look uh, mate or something on the mainland or something. No. It's too small. That one, they, they got a good estimate for size, and it's much smaller. It's not anything like a, a roping with a tail seven meters long, not nearly that big. It was possibly a, another one that came to check out the island and then found out that it was already uh, owned by a very big roping, so oh, we're going to go back. Or maybe it was for mating, or courtship, whatever. So I don't want to be dogmatic, because when I left Amboy Island in the year 2004 and went back to the mainland of New Guinea, and, and a few weeks, a few days later, went back to the United States, I, I had this, I don't know what you call it, epiphany, but I had this sudden thought came to me. There's only one large ropen is that inhabits Amboy Island. And I don't want to be dogmatic now, I want to see it in a broader sense. <clears throat> the natives never see more than one light flying at a time. So there's only one large ropen at any particular night that basically owns that island, thinks of itself as an owner and will control the territory of the island and go wherever it wants to go to catch fish at night. Only one at a time that really controls things. But there can be smaller ones that come and go for whatever reason. Okay, but it's the same species. And I think I already mentioned Evelyn Cheeseman said that the, oh, the, um, she estimated the light lasted four to five seconds. And that's pretty close. Four to five seconds is near the same as uh, five seconds, and it's also pretty near the same as the Gibson's estimate, five to six seconds. It's, it's the same species or a related species of flying creature there in the, in that part of Papua New Guinea. Okay, but there are exceptions. I don't think that everything is the same. We have another uh, set of two expeditions by pollination, which was also in the interior of the mainland of New Guinea, but south of where Elsvill and Cheeseman was decades earlier. His first expedition is more significant, I think. He saw the flying lights, but they did not have that characteristic. Uh, in other words, they were not limited to just a few seconds, like five seconds. It was not that, as I recall. I Sorry, I don't have the exact details, but they lasted longer, maybe not the same species, 
but very possibly maybe also a living pterosaur. And they were um, observed, and we got notes of that. And that's also in my book, uh, Searching for Opens and Finding God. So, um, any more questions we have about this? Uh, let's see how many people we have going here right now. We have um, off and on more like eight, seven or eight uh, people here. Thank you for coming. The subject is bioluminescence in modern pterosaurs. <clears throat> so we can go off on anything you like there. They're not restricted to just certain areas. And as far as I can tell, that the ropens in general might have a, a more general capacity for intrinsic bioluminescence. Intrinsic means there's some control over it, some control at least. And I have believe, could be mistaken, the sightings at Yakima River at night in southeastern Washington state do not abide exactly by those five second, five second rule. You know, I know, and I, I have to look into that. Sorry, just forget what I said. I have to get back. It's been a while since I've gotten into those details and that's in my book, but I, I don't read my book very often. So there are um, some cases where there are some barn owls, Tidal alba, or something similar to that species of barn owl, that can glow under certain conditions. Um, and it might be a trait that is being lost gradually over a period of many centuries, as the barn owl has is called uh, this particular kind of evolution. Uh, some people call it devolution. It's a downward process of evolution where some something originally had a, a higher capacity or trait, and then over time it's it's lost that. You see it in blind fish that have just remnants of eyes. They they lose the uh, um, those things that they had. They become less. <coughs> They're kind of like the opposite. This is what you usually think of like evolution. Just they they go downhill. Possibly the barn owls are in that process now. And so you don't see barn owls glowing much. Uh, and if you do, you wouldn't recognize it as a barn owl. But that shows you it's not just parent modern pterosaurs that are flying creatures that have bioluminescent poss possibility of, of a, a bioluminescence that's uh, intrinsic. In other words, it's not some kind of fungus that they picked up in a cave, nothing like that. They turn it on when they need it. And uh, and we have another book that I don't have in front of me. But it's it's uh, called uh, The Min Min Light, The Visitor Who Never Arrives, or something like that, by Brad Silcock. S-I-L-C-O-C-K, -I, I believe. And that's a good book. Excellent. I highly recommend it. It's hard to find. You can't. I don't think it's available on Amazon or something like that. Very well researched. Very well. Those who are coming back, um, I've done some uh, analysis of certain things that I found in this book by a scientist, James Bunnell. Hunting Marfa Lights is a fascinating book. It's not for, for, for everybody. It's, it's, it's just details about his research, what he's learned about these flying lights in this part of Texas. And there are, he's categorized the different lights. I mean, he's categorized all these different kind of lights, and some of them are uh, particular mirage type of lights from headlights under certain atmospheric conditions, and they appear uh, extremely unusual, strange, but they're not really unknown. They're car headlights, just under strange conditions. And then the other ones, which come back about six times a year, and I'm sorry, I know I'm repeating this, but people might have come in. <clears throat> these other lights that are seen in that same part of Texas are not seen as much out toward that highway, but out toward the the um, the vacant land where the cattle roam around. They do have ranches, of course, here and there, but the, the ranchers, when they're out in the truck at night, which is not often, but they do sometimes drive a truck at night with the car headlights on, that will make a light out in another area, not by the highway, because this is out in the 
Ranch Road, you know. But these mysterious lights coming about six times a year, they do not, not anything like car headlights. They're different uh, light qualities. Uh, the analysis done on the frequency, the type of light it is, it's, it's very strange. We could get into something else, too. And I don't have photographs to show you right now. But um, uh, one part of my book, uh, Searching for Ropens and Finding God, is about Paul Nation, my associate of Paul Nation. He went on a, a couple expeditions on the mainland. One of them significant. This was, well, let's see, my expedition in 2004. I started writing that book in the first edition in 2005, finished in 2006. Late in 2006, like around late, late October, early November, he went on this particular expedition, and he had an incredible opportunity to, to videotape these two lights that had stopped and had flown down to this ridge that was nearby. He videotaped them for a number of seconds, and that videotape, I got a copy of it. I went to Texas to interview him when he came home and got a copy of that video footage, and I took it home and gave it to Garth Gessman, who gave it to this uh, missile defense physicist, Clifford Piva, who uh, specialized in that kind of analysis of video footage. And he, he did a scientific paper, a fascinating paper. I published parts of it online, if you want to look at that. But I found that the that this and it's not car headlights, it's not it's not satellites, it's not meteors, it's not ca campfires, not flashlights, which the British call um, um, not flashlights, but the torches. <laughs> it's not that kind of thing. It's nothing like that. It's something different. Now, uh, the, the scientist Clifford Piva did not have the particular kind of skill or opportunity to say definitely it was bioluminescence, but he could just rule out so many things that what else is there? What else could it be? Those two lights that flew down onto that ridge in that jungle area of Papua New Guinea and were videotaped in 2006 by pollination, that's not a common kind of light. It's not a campfire, not anything like that. Definitely not fireflies. The, the size of, of one of them was something like this size. That's the size you know, when you look at the daytime image of the trees in the area, you can gauge about what size things were. The glow was about this this big, you know, not a firefly. <laughs> and that was fascinating, the scientific paper on that. And very few people know about that. It was not published in a peer-reviewed journal, but I published uh, parts of it and put it into regular English so people could understand. <laughs> the scientist Clifford Piva, you know, uses technical language and saying what he's doing, you know, and what things are. Hard to understand for most people. So I put in my own English standard, uh, regular English language version of what's, what he's talking about. Um, so let's see how many people we have here right now. See how it's going. It's more like down to about eight, maybe nine. Glad you're all here. Thank you for coming. Let's get back to the uh, chat. Yeah, we don't have any more contributions here, so we're not going to spend too much more time. It's it's now six oh five uh, p.m. Mountain Time, Utah Time. But glad we could get get through this and go over some of these things about bioluminescence in modern pterosaurs. And there are other sightings. I probably missed something important because they're seen all over the world. But um, uh, sometimes used for fishing, catching fish, for example, in the northwestern United States and uh, parts of Washington State and uh, Oregon. Um, but I encourage people just let people know about these things. This, this is scientific. I've written a scientific paper that was published in a peer-reviewed journal. It was reviewed, peer-reviewed. And that's not easy. It took a long time. I'd, I'd rather write a book than to go through peer-reviewed process of writing a scientific paper. That takes a long time. But I got that done. That was uh, 
reports of living pterosaurs in the Southwest Pacific, if you want to look online for my scientific paper. Basically, it's a, a number of things related to, to, to modern pterosaurs that appear to live in the Southwest Pacific and my expedition and the expedition of uh, uh, others. So uh, let's get together again a week from today. We'll be um, having a different subject. <coughs> Feel free to tell me anything you like about these videos or this video, what you like about it so I can know what to concentrate on, what to look into more. Um, Feel free to go to the comment section if you can. If you have on a desktop, it's, I think it's easier. But go to the comment section below this video after it's published uh, in the regular way on YouTube after the live streaming is over. And then um, leave your comment. What do you like about this? What would you like to hear more about? What would you like to be the same? What would you like to be different? You know, feel free to, if you like something, or any other of the videos that I have, maybe the shorter videos that are more entertaining of music and special effects and are more succinct and uh, can you get through them quicker and just generally more fun to watch i think thank you so much for being here we'll get together again okay thank you have a good night